Hey, guys, this, can you hear me? This microphone is wild. It connects to the other ear. <laughs> Usually it's just one, you know, the one Britney Spears side, but here we are. Well, yeah, like, like George or Ty said, my name is Jared. I have the joy of teaching Hebrew here and Old Testament. Uh, my office, yeah, whoa, got some woos here. Shout out to Ian. He said if I said that, he would give me his trophy gift card. Now that's mine because I gave you a shout out. Yeah. <laughs> My office is right next to Dr. Chow's, and my, I think my official job description is just do whatever he says. That's it. And whatever Dr. Halstead says. So the last time I spoke here was when I was a student. And, you know, I had a weird dream the night before, so I woke up early, and I'm tossing, and I'm turning, and I wake up, and, you know, I have to get my dress clothes on, so I, I get all dressed up, and I walk outside my dorm room. I get outside and something just feels weird. And I go, man, something feels weird. And man, I'm tired. And I look down and realize I'm not wearing any pants. <laughs> and I go, oh. <laughs> so, thankfully, it was too early. No one was there. I go back in my dorm room, put my pants on, go back down here and preach. And last night, lo and behold, I had a bad dream. I woke up early. I get dressed. I walk outside my apartment, and this time I had pants on. So, you know, step one, wear pants. Step two, preach. We are officially in step two, people. Let me pray, and we'll get this thing started. Sorry, that's like a weird way to build rapport, but here we are. All right, I got to get through this. Let's, let's pray. Lord, Lord, your word is true, and so please sanctify us in the truth now this morning. Amen. You know, eight years ago, I walked through those doors right there, and I was devastated. I had tears in my eyes. I sat down somewhere over there in the back. The chapel used to be different, but I mean, I was sitting over there, which used to be the back. And I had no, I had no clue what the chapel message was that morning. I was just trying my best to keep it together. The night before, I had got a call from my best friend. I was a Bible major here at TMU, but he was a Bible major at another college on the East Coast. And me and this guy, we grew up together. Him and I were so close that it was like I had another brother. And he called me and he told me that he was abandoning the gospel and walking away from the faith. And I said, what do you mean? I mean, back home, we study the Bible all the time together. We were counselors at a Christian camp together. We preached the gospel to Jehovah's Witnesses inside their kingdom halls together. We were small group leaders at our home church together. We translated the book of James in your grandma's basement together. We were baptized together. I couldn't believe what was happening. I said, what do you mean? that you're done with Christ and Christianity. And here's what he said. He said, you interpret the Bible wrong. We've been interpreting the Bible wrong. And I said, look, you might, but hey, I don't. I care about what the author intends. I study the, the grammar, the literary, the cultural, the historical context. I'm looking at the meaning of words and phrases. I got these commentaries. I got these dusty dictionaries. That's how we do this. That's not, he said, how it works. Why would you study like that? if the authors of the Bible didn't study like that. And his point was as simple as it was serious. What if the truth that you prize in your heart is no truth at all because you interpreted scripture wrongly? What if you got it all wrong? That's a bold claim. Is it not? Because if you attack our hermeneutic, our method of arriving to the right interpretation of the text, you attack everything. This is like going for the jugular, jugular. This is that Thanos snap, except now everything dies. And all the back and forth, our whole conversation, everything came down to a single passage. This was the one verse to him that was his silver bullet. It was that nail in the coffin that caused him to pack his bags and say that the whole of our faith was nonsense. Matthew 2, 15. Listen to what it says. It says this, he remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet 
out of Egypt, I called my son. Now, if you are anything like me, and you heard all that he said, and you turned to this passage like you're doing right now, and you read it, there would be some confusion. What's the big deal here? I mean, how do you go from this was to fulfill What had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet out of Egypt, I called my son in Matthew 2.15, to jumping off a spiritual cliff. And here's how. That phrase, out of Egypt I called my son, is a quotation from Hosea 11.1. And in context, in context, Hosea 11.1 is talking about the nation the nation of Israel, and their history of how God had previously delivered them from Egypt in the book of Exodus. Do you see the problem now? When Matthew quotes Hosea 11.1, it sounds like Matthew just throws caution to the wind and goes, you know what? This isn't about Israel anymore. It's actually about Jesus. And this isn't about the Exodus and the past anymore. It's actually a prophecy now about Jesus as a baby boy being delivered from Herod in the future. That's a big deal. And if Matthew, an author of Scripture, if he changed or modified the meaning of the Bible, or if he was careless or reckless with the Bible, or if he treated the Bible as anything less than authoritative, then maybe he didn't think the Bible was true. After all, if God's word is the truth, you would never change it. You would never modify it or be careless or reckless with it or treat it as anything less than authoritative, anything less than the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. My friend took this to its logical end point and said, I'm done with Christianity because even the authors of scripture don't think this book is true. That was my introduction to Matthew 2.15. You know, there are moments in life that are defining, moments that shape so much of, of who we are and why we do what we do. And that conversation was one of those moments for me. And I wish that I could stand up here and say, that I laid it all out there, that I left no stone unturned, but I know that I didn't. And as humiliating and as crushing as it was, it taught me the stakes are high. What you do here matters. What you learn here matters. Your Bible classes matter. Your ability to handle God's word rightly, man, that really matters. This moment forced me to take God's word seriously like never before, to cut my teeth, to dig deep and figure out what has God said about Matthew 2.15. And so this sermon is about one verse, Matthew 2.15, that's it. What does it mean? And maybe put it this way, this sermon is just everything that I wish I told my best friend about Matthew 2.15 eight years ago. So let's begin. Let's begin. Our time together this morning centers around one phrase, one phrase, my son, the phrase my son. After all, in Matthew 2, 15, Matthew says, out of Egypt I called my son. And if we understand this phrase, and if we trace this thread through the Bible, then we will understand Matthew 2, 15. So we need to laser focus on that phrase, my son. We need to trace this thread, and we need to see how does it all unfold. So turn to Exodus 4. Turn to Exodus 4. And while you're turning there, by way of reminder, God has made some serious promises in the book of Genesis. He tells Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that a great nation will come from them, a nation with a great name, a nation who would live in the land of Canaan, a nation who would be protected by God himself. And as we come to Exodus 4, sure, Israel has become a large nation, but they become a large nation of brick-making slaves under Egyptian tyrants in the land of Goshen. During the days of Moses, these promises were hanging in the balance. The people were wondering, does God care about us? Will he be faithful to us? Does he even remember us? Exodus 4, verse 22. Read it with me. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says Yahweh, Israel is my son my firstborn. That phrase, my son, my firstborn, would have answered all of their questions. Israel is not some whatever, who cares, no name, group of nobodies. Israel is God's son. And if you need an illustration 
uh, about a year ago, I got into a weird hobby, maybe bordering on an obsession of collecting Super Mario pins, the video game character. There was just something about that small Italian man <laughs> in the form of a shiny pin that made my monkey brain go, I need him, and I need a lot of them. And so I start buying all the rarest and coolest, big quotation marks around coolest, Super Mario pins. Okay, so some pins were from Belgium, others were from Germany, the UK, and France. I'm shaking hands, I'm making deals, and after months of collecting Super Mario pins, I get the collection framed, and I put it on the floor next to our couch. Two days later, my wife gives birth, and we bring our son home, and I'm holding my son Miles for literally the second time ever, and I look over at my Super Mario pin collection, and I say to myself, what was wrong with me? <laughs> Those tiny, shiny pins in the form of that small Italian video game character man, those things mean nothing to me anymore. Why? Because now my life is forever tethered to and is orbiting around my son. There's no relationship like this for me. Those pins, they just don't make the cut. And in the same way, just as a father has a unique and powerful, a compelling and an exceptional love for his son, so too God has a unique and powerful, a compelling and exceptional love for his son, Israel. Israel was so adored, Israel was so cherished and prized by God that it drove him to bring about the first exodus. God can't and God will not and God won't give up, give them up because they are his son. What would God do for Israel, his son? He would cripple an entire nation. He would split a sea. He would swallow an army. The nation saw and were struck with terror. Their hearts melted away because they saw what God would do for his son Israel. They saw the first exodus. And the love that God has for his son Israel, it becomes the love of ages. It's a love that spans decades and centuries and even beyond. And that's what we see again in Psalm 80. Turn there, turn there. Psalm 80. And while you're turning there to Psalm 80, in the days of Asaph, Israel was once again in dire need of being rescued, which is why Asaph says things like in verse 2, come save us, or verse 3, restore us, O God. The nation is in such despair, it's said in verse 5, that their food and drink are their tears. And when it looks once again like the promises of God are hanging in the balance. You know what Asaph thinks back to? Look at verse eight. You brought a vine out of Egypt. Asaph remembers the Exodus. He goes back to that story of old where Yahweh refused to give up his people, where Yahweh pulled his people out of Egypt like a vine out of the ground. And he remembers afterwards how Yahweh drove out the nations, how Yahweh cleared the ground, planted Israel the vine so that it could grow and become beautiful. And it's on the basis of what God did in the past that Asaph can pray in verse 14. Read it with me. O oh God of hosts, return now, we beseech you, look down from heaven and see and take care of this vine. Asaph knows that just as God rescued the nation the first time, his love would drive another rescue. The point is, God did it once and so he would surely do it again after all. In verse 15, Israel is called the what? The son. Israel has always been God's son, cherished, prized, and adored. And so Asaph knows that, hey, that past deliverance demands and must lead to a future deliverance. He looks back at the first exodus, which then causes him to look forward to a new exodus. And so, so far, we've seen that God's love for his son, Israel, is something that's immense. It's something that's far-reaching. It's the love of ages. But God's love is also something that's specific and particular, something that becomes funneled and concentrated into a dynasty of kings. Turn to 2 Samuel 7. Turn to 2 Samuel 7. And while you're turning there, Israel has always... 
Israel has always needed a king. In fact, in Deuteronomy 17, before Israel even enters into the promised land, God tells them that they need a king of God's own choosing. They needed the right kind of king. And leading up to 2 Samuel, we've seen the wrong kind of king with Saul. 1 Samuel has chronicled the tragedy of King Saul. Israel picked a loser for their king, and they paid the price because their king was a loser. But the failures of Saul all the more highlight the triumphs of David. And as we come to 2 Samuel 7, God crystallizes the descendants of David as the dynasty of kings. And listen to what God says, starting in verse 12. When your days are complete, and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you. I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Verse 14, I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. He will be my son. That phrase, a son to me or my son, that should sound familiar. We've heard something just like that in Exodus 4.22 and Psalm 80, 2 Samuel 7, it takes those threads. It takes that, that theology and it intertwines them into the Davidic dynasty. These kings will be God's son who, as it was in Exodus 4.22, as it was in Psalm 80, will be a son that's cherished, that's prized, that's adored, but more than this. And what is absolutely essential to understand is that Israel as God's son is now linked to the Davidic king as God's son. In other words, the Davidic king represents the entire nation of Israel now as God's son. And now the experiences of the nation become his experiences. His failure becomes their failure. His victory can become their victory as the one represents the many, the nation and the Davidic king are forever linked together. One son is tied to the other son. David knows this, which is why in Psalm 18, David recounts how God used hail and fire and thunder in order to rescue him, just like how God used hail and fire and thunder to rescue the nation of Israel in Exodus. Also in Psalm 18, David recounts how God was his rock and refuge in his own wilderness wanderings, just as God was Israel's rock and refuge during their wilderness wanderings in Exodus. David knows that the experiences of the nation become the experiences of the king. One son experiences what the other son experienced. And similarly, the triumph of the king becomes the triumph of the nation. And we've seen that one chapter after in 2 Samuel 8, where David defeats the Philistines, the Moabites, the Arameans, even the Edomites become servants to David. And because of that, Israel has rest and there's justice and there's righteousness in the land. David's victory becomes their victory because he is their king. He represents them. The victory of the one son becomes the victory of the other son. But the failure of the king also becomes the failure of the nation. Like in 1 Chronicles 21, when David sinfully takes a census to boast in his own might and own military strength, so then God sends a plague upon the nation. Or Solomon in 1 Kings 11, whose heart was turned away after other gods. So God raises up enemies who begin to terrorize the peace once enjoyed in Solomon's kingdom. Or Solomon's son, Rehoboam in 1 Kings 12, whose arrogance and pride split the kingdom apart. Even Hezekiah in 2 Kings 20, who makes a pact with Babylon, the enemy. And so God says, fine, you love Babylon so much, then coming are the days of exile when all your people will be carried off into Babylon. The failures of the king, the failures of the son become the failures of the other son. The failures of the Davidic kings demand a future Davidic king who would never fail. A king who would only have victory and thereby give victory to his people, which brings us back now to the hope 
of 2 Samuel 7, the hope for the final, the hope for the greatest, the hope for the true Davidic king. Because Israel does not just need a king from the line of David. Israel needs the king from the line of David. And 2 Samuel says, the day is coming when the king will arrive. And when he does, the victory of that son becomes the victory of the other son, of the other son. And as the passing of time, and as the anticipation for the arrival of the king, and for the arrival of that son grows, history becomes tethered to, history orbits around him, because this king is the hero of ages. Turn to Psalm 2. Turn to Psalm 2. And while you're turning there, this issue of a hero, this issue of the hero of ages, it has always been at the center, at the very heart of redemptive history. Genesis 3.15 prophesies of a new Adam who succeeds where the first Adam failed. Uh, a hero who can crush the head of Satan. Genesis 49, 10 through 12 prophesies that this new Adam will come from the tribe of Judah. He'll be this king who can usher in an era of peace, obedience, and blessing. In Numbers 24, this king rules over an exalted kingdom that looks like the Garden of Eden. History bends to the weight of this hero. And as we come to Psalm 2, we hear this hero speak for the very first time, recounting what the father said to him. Listen to verse seven. I will surely tell of the decree of Yahweh. He said to me, you are my son. And to be sure, this son will be cherished and prized and adored above all else. But even more, like the Davidic kings of old, this final Davidic king will represent Israel and he will share in their experiences. This son becomes their champion. And the victory of this son becomes the victory of the other son, Israel. But not just for Israel. Because do you see in verse 12, look at this, where it says kiss the son, yeah? Or where it says do homage to the son, the word there for the son is not Hebrew. Very strange. It's Aramaic. Why? Because the father is not just talking to Israel. It's he's talking to all the nations. The son, this son becomes the champion of even the Gentiles. And so he truly is the hero of ages, because his victory becomes the victory now for all of his people, Jews and Gentiles, Jews and Gentiles. And these threads of hero and Messiah, of sonship and kingship, of exodus and exile, in all of these verses that we've covered, they all become woven into the fabric of the book of Hosea. So turn there, turn to Hosea 11. Turn to Hosea 11. And by way of reminder, in the days of Hosea, Israel chose the path of the prostitute. She broke her marriage vows and she chose to love everything and everyone except for God. The covenant of marriage, it depicts the richest and most unifying love known to man, but Israel wanted nothing to do with God or God's love. And so God promises to throw the northern kingdom into exile. The people needed to start over. They needed to go back to the beginning as it was in the book of Exodus. But now, instead of, the hand, instead of slavery by the hand of Egypt, it would now be slavery by the hand of Assyria. Even though, even though and even so, in the darkness of their sorrow, Hosea looks forward to an era to a time when the nation of Israel will be transformed spiritually. A future where they have forgiveness and spiritual life and have been made new from the inside out. And in the end of days, cross-reference Hosea 1.11. There will be one leader who unites the nation together. And though Hosea has only known a kingdom divided in the future, he sees a kingdom united as it was in the days of Solomon, as it was in the days of David. 
And so it's no surprise that in Hosea 3 verse 5, this leader in the future is identified as the final Davidic king. In the latter days, Hosea 3 5 says that Israel will finally return to this new David, the Messiah, because they've learned and because they will learn that this one is the one who can spearhead a new exodus to save them in every sense of the word. And so with this in mind, look now at Hosea 11.1. 1. When Israel was a youth, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. And to be sure, Hosea 11.1 1 is talking about the nation of Israel and their history about how God had previously delivered them from Egypt in the book of Exodus. But like Asaph in Psalm 80, Hosea knows that just as God rescued the nation the first time, that his love would then drive another rescue. And his love will drive another rescue because Israel is my son. His love for them is the love of ages. And so God cannot, and he will not, and he refuses to give up Israel. And Hosea knows, especially in light of 2 Samuel 7 and Psalm 2, that God will rescue his son Israel through his son the king. One son rescues the other son. Even though Israel was a prostitute, even though she went after other lovers, even though she loved pieces of wood more than God, even though nobody would ever blame God for abandoning Israel, God's love is the love of ages. And one day, Hosea knows, the hero of ages will arrive. On the verge of exile, when the promises of God are hanging in the balance, Hosea teaches no one loves like Yahweh. And because of that, Hosea knows what God did in the past will drive something similar, but even more sensational in the future of one son rescuing the other son. What would God do for a people who are so cherished, so prized, and so adored? Hosea knows God will send his son the leader, the king, the one whom history becomes tethered to and orbits around. And by this son, he will rescue the other son. And so with all this in mind now, turn to Matthew 2. Turn to Matthew 2. And as we come to this book, Matthew makes an announcement to the world he blows the trumpet to announce the arrival of the king. He says the king of the Jews, the king of the Gentiles is here. The wait is over. The search is done. The hero of ages has arrived. And now Matthew proves this on every single page. And let me show you how this works. In Matthew 1, this one is called the Messiah, the one who is the rightful heir to the Davidic throne by birth, the one who will save his people, both Jews and Gentiles from their sin. The one whom history has always been tethered to and orbits around. Matthew says, so sound the trumpet. The last Davidic king has been born and his name is Jesus. Also, Matthew 2 verse 1 records that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Why be born in Bethlehem? Why not be born in Jerusalem? Why not be born in Timbuktu or wherever? Because David was born in Bethlehem. And when the line of Davidic kings is collapsing in on itself, in Micah 5, Micah 5 verse 2 prophesies that the final Davidic king will be born in Bethlehem. Micah says the line of kings will finish where they started, in Bethlehem. Matthew 2 verse 1, so sound the trumpet because Jesus is the king. Or look at Matthew 2 verse 2. The Magi from the east mentioned that they saw his star. 
his star? What's the big deal with this star? And how did they even know to connect a star with the arrival of the king? Because they knew the prophecy of Numbers 24, verse 17. Let me read it to you. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near a star, a star shall come forth from Jacob, a scepter shall rise from Israel. According to Numbers 24, this star is what sounds the trumpet for the arrival of the king. And the magi say, we saw that. So now we know that the trumpet has been blown because the king has arrived. Or look at Matthew 2 verse 3. When Herod the king When Herod the king hears about this, the text says that he was troubled. The text says that he was disturbed. More specifically, he feels the kind of terror that grips a hold of and paralyzes a person. Why is Herod the king so afraid of a tiny baby named Jesus? Because now he knows the trumpet has been sound, that the true king, the real king, has arrived. Or Matthew 2 verses 4 through 14, Herod plots to murder Jesus. This guy cares more about his crown than his soul. And when the angel of the Lord appears to Joseph and commands him to take Jesus and his mother to Egypt and remain there, we once again have to ask, why? Why Egypt? Why not another place? like Babylon or Assyria? Why not somewhere super far away like Antarctica or Australia or New Zealand? Egypt was the launching point for the nation, for the nations to witness the unique and the powerful, the compelling, and the exceptional love that God had for his son Israel. God formed his nation in Egypt. In Egypt. And just as we saw in 2 Samuel 7 and Psalm 2, Israel, who is God's son, is linked to the Davidic king, who is God's son. The Davidic king represents the entire nation of Israel as God's son. The son experiences what the other son experienced, what the other son experienced. Why did Jesus have to go to Egypt? Because Israel was in Egypt because the experiences of the nation become the experiences of the king. And so the angel of the Lord says, sound the trumpet. Your champion is here. Jesus is that king. Jesus is the Davidic king. And so now with all of this in mind, finally, let's look at Matthew 2, 15 and read it again with me. He remained there until the death of Herod, This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. And before we get into that phrase, out of Egypt I called my son, do you guys see that word fulfill, the word fulfill there, yeah? This was to fulfill. We need to talk about what does that word fulfill mean. And sometimes whenever we hear the word fulfill, we typically think of it in the context of prophecy, as in there was this prophecy over here in the past, which now is fulfilled over here in the future or in that present day. That's not always how the word fulfill gets used. And a good example of this is in James 2, is in James 2. And in context, James is explaining how, hey, real faith doesn't just talk the talk, real faith rather walks the walk, that good deeds verify a saving faith and that lip service means nothing. And so James says, let me illustrate that principle for you. And so James mentions in Genesis 22, where Abraham nearly offered up and sacrificed Isaac. And right after, in reference to Genesis 22, James says, and listen to this, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And now James knows that that previous quotation of Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness in Genesis 15 verse six was not a prophecy about Abraham one day attempting to sacrifice Isaac in Genesis 22, but rather James uses the word fulfill when something is brought to its fullest ramification. 
In other words, the word fulfill can look at how the truth of something over here is now worked out in this action over here. And so Abraham's faith in God in Genesis 15 verse 6 is worked out. It's brought to its fullest ramification whenever he nearly sacrifices Isaac later in Genesis 22. Well, in the same way, the word fulfill in Matthew 2.15 is not in the context of prophecy. Matthew is using the word fulfill like how James used the word fulfill in order to explain how how the truth of something over here is being worked out and is now brought to its fullest ramification in something, in this case, in someone over here. And so what truth does Matthew reflect on in the past out of Egypt I called my son. And we know now where that quotation comes from, from Hosea 11.1. 1. And what is notable is that Matthew could have quoted from Exodus 4.22, yeah? He could have said something like, this was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Israel is my son, my firstborn. But instead, Matthew does not quote from the book of Exodus. Instead, he quotes from Hosea. Why? Because Matthew wants to talk about the Exodus in the same way that Hosea talked about the Exodus. And you know how Hosea was talking about the Exodus. In the days of Hosea, the people needed to start over. Exile by the hands of the Assyrians was on the horizon. The day was approaching when Israel, because of their sin, had to go back to the beginning as it was during their time in Egypt in the book of Exodus. But Hosea knew And we saw this, that the past leads to the future. And Hosea anticipated the one who would restore Israel both physically and spiritually in the future. Hosea anticipated the leader who is identified as the Messiah, the one who is the final Davidic king. Hosea anticipated the arrival of the individual who would save his people. And Hosea knew that one son rescues the other son. Matthew quotes from Hosea because he wants to talk about the Exodus in the same way that Hosea talked about the Exodus. And now Matthew pulls on this thread of my son. He pulls these threads together like the the thread in Exodus 4, the thread in Psalm 80, or 2 Samuel 7, or Psalm 2, and Hosea 11.1. And he takes this theology and he shows now how it has been worked out and brought to its fullest ramification and finds its crescendo now in Christ. Matthew says, sound the trumpet. The king has arrived the one who spearheads a new exodus in order to deliver and save his people is here. The one who rescues the other son has arrived. The son who rescues the other son has arrived. And we know this son conquered sin. We know that this son, that the final son, conquered death, that he can change people and make people new from the inside out, and that he will make everything new and right in the end. The father sent his only begotten son to adopt us, the Gentiles, as his son. The son who rescues and adopts sons has arrived. So now Matthew says, we found the champion, the champion of the Jews and the Gentiles, the hero of ages, and his name is Jesus. So sound the trumpet. That is Matthew 2.15. Matthew knew his Bible. Matthew didn't change or modify the meaning. He wasn't careless or reckless, and he never treated the Bible as anything less than authoritative. Matthew was a theologian. Matthew was a scholar. Matthew was smarter than all of us, than all of us, and he got it right. He got it right. He cared about the author's intention. He cared about the literary and the cultural and the historical context and the grammar and the meaning of words, even the meaning of a phrase like my son. He studied the Bible how we study the Bible and he studied the truth. 
He knew the truth, and he treasured the truth far more than many give him credit for. To Matthew, God's word is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And so let's land this plane, and let me end our time together with this. As the book of Matthew unfolds, and as the sounding of each trumpet testifies, those trumpets testify to the fact that there is only one who is worth everything that you have, all your strength and might, all your love and affection, all your devotion and sacrifice, your surrender and allegiance, everything is due to Jesus because he is the one who no one ever was. Wherever you go, whatever you do, let it all be unto him, make it count, lay it at his feet in worship because the trumpet has been sound. Matthew 2.15 has ringed and we've heard the crescendo of that text because Jesus is the king, because Jesus is the hero of ages. Let's pray. Lord, would you fix our eyes and set our heart upon the Son, the Son who will save the Son, the Son who has now made us and adopted us as sons, our King, our champion, the hero of ages. Amen.